Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. <coughs> Thank you, Brother Daniel, for reading the God's scripture. The book of Proverbs. Please bear with me today. I'm still a little wobbly, but uh, we'll get through it today. I wanted to talk this morning about the topic, Little Sins That Damn a Nation. You know, someday our descendants, maybe even, you know, maybe not children, grandchildren, but some descendants will look back and say, what caused y'all to get all messed up in your country, in America? What caused all this ethical and moral and spiritual slide decline in our nation? You know, we now are prospering, I know in this part of the country, prospering very much, but many people are poor on the inside. Lawlessness and violence continue to grow in our country. Perversion has replaced virtue in many hearts. As Solomon says, righteousness exalts the nation, but sin is reproach to any people. But I believe the chief reason for that is because many people today, including some Christians, there's this toleration of sin in their lives. But you know, brethren, there is no such thing as a little sin. According to God's standard, the Word of God. Luke chapter 16, verse 15. <clears throat> Jesus said, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your heart. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Any sin is sin in God's sight. But some people say, well, you know, you know, as long as uh, you're not, you haven't murdered anybody recently, you haven't stolen much money, we can just ignore all that. Examples of little sins we're going to talk about today, well, some of them we'll talk about today is, for example, cursing and profanity. I grew up in the oil fields of West Texas. Let me tell you folks, if I hadn't heard it, it's not in the, it's, it's not, there's no such profanity if I hadn't heard it. Because <laughs> that's where it was, where I grew up. But they never said this before a woman. And, and they never, never said it before a lot of other people except the ones they worked out in the oil field with, with mainly. But today that's changed. Fanny's everywhere. How about gambling? Drinking of alcohol? Smoking? Immorality? Dancing? And you could go on and on. All people say, well, that's just a little sin. You know, one time these little sins were warned against from almost every pulpit, not in, just in the Lord's Church either. Every pulpit, every Sunday school class, every home. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not part from it. Turn that verse around. Don't train up a child in the way he should go, and then when he's old, what will he have left, or he, or she? Very little. Today's very idea condemning sin is considered old-fashioned. Some way you're, in, you're inhibiting others, or you're just, it might be even harmful what you're doing. Isaiah 5, verse 20 is, answers it so well when Isaiah said, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. They put darkness for light and light for darkness. They put, put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them. So today I want to examine <clears throat> pardon me, some of these so-called little sins 
in the light of God's Word. I mentioned one already, the sin of gambling. You know, who would have thought a couple a generation or so ago that legalized theft, and that's what gambling is, would have made such inroads in our society? There are denominations now that they will have bingo, raffles, and anything else that comes along that involves gambling. Oh, and that's to support our ministry. They'll say, oh, we're going to send our kids off to a mission trip down in South America somewhere or something. And we're having this big raffle here. Come and support all this. How right about the lottery? The lottery has made virtually every convenience store into a slot machine, if you know what that is. And it preys upon the ignorant and the poor. I've seen people come in there. I've, a friend of mine told me this a couple years ago. He was in, a, in Texas. They have them there too, lotteries. He was in a convenience store, kind of a cafe convenience store, you know, and sitting over there drinking his coffee. And in comes this woman and she plucks out I don't know how much money. And they give her, a, she gets several scratch art, scratch off cards and she's scratching away and finally, oh, hooray, jumps up and down. She had won $50. I bet she spent $500 to spend that, to win that $50. Indian casinos. Indian reservations have been turned to casinos. Back where I'm from, north of me, there was a real big tribe, Mescalero Apache. They were known for their farming and ranching and for their lumbering and lumber mills. And then they put in a casino and a horse race and betting and everything, and the whole thing changed. How about sports betting? Big billion dollar quote industry. You, both, you, you bet on any game that comes along. Now, why is gambling a sin? Here's just a few reasons. As I mentioned earlier, gambling is basically legalized theft. You're stealing. <clears throat> you put down your money because the other poor sucker will lose his. That's what it is. The Bible tells us that money should be attain attained one of two ways. Either by work or as a gift, free gift. Ephesians 4, verse 28. Paul didn't, they had gambling back then. Remember, they gambled at the foot of the cross. The Roman guards did. Paul said, Ephesians 4, verse 28. Let him that steal, steal, stole, steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good he may have to give to him that needeth. That's not what gambling is, is it? You don't give to some who needs. You hope that your neighbor loses. Individuals agree to steal from one another, but that doesn't make it right just because they agree to do that. Matthew 7, verse 12, Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do even so to them. That's called the golden rule. But you know, gambling is also idolatry. There's a word you don't hear much anymore. It's called covetousness. Which is a desire or longing for something another person has. You want that other person's money. Colossians 3 verse 5 says covetousness is idolatry. Colossians 3 verse 5. Lusting or longing for anything other than God. Placing one's trust in the false God of chance. Covetousness is idolatry. My friends, idolatry, the Bible teaches us over and over and over again, will damn a nation. Revelation 21 verse 8 lists idolatry among other sins. Idolatry will damn a nation. Let's look at another so-called small sin, actually two of them. That's smoking and drinking. You know, our nation is being pickled to death by alcohol and smothered by nicotine. I remember when I went to college, we would preserve specimens in alcohol. 
observe an alcohol. You know, I could quote you health statistics about cancer and cirrhosis of the liver and on and on and on and on and on, whatever you want. All day long, you can look at those yourself, but you, you, all you have to do is go to the cemetery. Because there you see cemeteries where people who were consumed by their drug of choice, whether it be alcohol or tobacco or nicotine. I know in this town and probably other towns all around this area, everywhere in this country, there's a problem with drinking among young people in this town. Some people say, well, as long as they're not taking drugs. You know, they're not taking meth or smoking meth or, or cocaine or something like that. That's all right. But is it? Of course it's not. Because there's a pressure that's put on young people to be part of something. And it's put on older people too, but especially young people. You want to be part of it, your group. And they drink, and they have a big time, and they like each other, and then you want them to like you. Titus chapter 2, Paul dealt with such a situation. He reminded those people who had trouble with drinking as well. He said, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation appeared unto all men. Now what's that? The Gospel. Christ. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Soberly. Now that means seriously. But it also entails the idea of drinking. Another thing, alcohol and nicotine, as, as you well know, are both poisons. They're both poisons. They used to spray, and I think they still do, <clears throat> crops with nicotine. Kill bugs. And it's against God's Word for anyone to take poison and injure their body. <clears throat> Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 6. Paul writes, what? Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God gave you that body, not to abuse, but to use to His glory. Because it, if you're a Christian, it is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's temple should not be used for wickedness. Well, some people say, well, you only do this on occasion. Only occasionally have a drink. Only occasionally have a cigarette. I remember back when I was in college many years ago, the former president of Pepperdine University which used to be a Christian college, it's not anymore, but that aside. He told the story how that he, uh, as he became president, he had these dudes, he had to travel a lot, fly. And he was scared to death of flying. So, and this man was a preacher. And they, he noticed they started hanging out on, in our lines of little, little shots, little drinks. Well, to steady his nerves, he tried more. Well, it got to be he did it every time. He traveled a lot. And he would do it more than once. One time he got off his flight and he got in his car and he rear-ended an elderly couple and killed them both. And of course he was charged with drunk driving. One can, can one intentionally sin on occasion and be acceptable with God? 1 John 1, verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, with God, when walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Brethren, there will be no smoking and drinking in heaven. We can be assured of that. But some may say, you know, preacher, I just can't quit. And I understand that. I remember years ago when I went to preaching school, about 25 years ago, 
There was a young man who had dipped snuff for years. Gave it up. Come preacher. And he told me, he said, Rolf, every day at about 10 to 11 o'clock, I get this urge, I can't hardly control myself. For that little nip of nicotine. It's difficult. But notice what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Paul commands Christian, he says, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatsoever you do, do all of the glory of God. That covers it all, doesn't it? And there's, here's another one. It's even more powerful. Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do some things through Christ which strengthen me. Oh, I didn't read that right, did I? I can do most things, most of the time, through Christ that strengthens me. No. I can do all, A-O-L, all things through Christ which strengthen me. I can do all things. That means giving up the drink. It means giving up the e-cigarette. I can do all things. Not easy. But it wasn't easy for Christ to die on the cross for that sin either. Let's look at another small sin. Little sin. As some people would say. How about the modern dance? In the last few generations, and I'm talking about the last 25, 30 years, dancing has been totally accepted in our society. It's looked, down, it's looked on as a rite of passage for you. Oh, you go to the prom. Or, oh, she's going to have her, her first dance. And it's looked, you're looked down as abnormal and old-fashioned, whatever, if you don't engage in dancing. Brethren, you look in the Bible, and in many instances in the Bible, dancing is associated with lewdness, with rebellion against God, idolatry, and sexual immorality. One example. Among many. Exodus 32. Moses had come out of Egypt, gone to Mount Sinai. Was, Moses went up on that mount to receive the law. Forty days, forty nights. People said, where is he? What's happened to him? Aaron foolishly builds them a, a golden calf. And they fall down and worship it, and God says, the people have rebelled against me. Sends Moses down with those tablets of stone, the commandments, under his arm. And it says, as he came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hand and break them beneath the mountain. Now, what is sinful about the modern days? All oh, people are getting together, having a good time. The Bible associates it with the sin of lasciviousness. That's a word that doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. Which means indecent body movements. And we know what that means. Ephesians 5 verse 19 through 20, lists it as one of the works of the flesh. But that's not all dancing associated with. Dancing is also associated with the sin of reveling, which is mentioned as a work of the flesh in Ephesians 5, which is the losing of all inhibitions, carousing, linked to drinking, by the way. And those two grow together, that is, dancing and drinking in most cases. It can cause lust and sexual immorality. I think about this verse when I hear about this time of year, people, well, it was, well, this is a little earlier than this time of year. Well, I'll just go to the prom, that's all right, I'll have a good time. Jesus said in Matthew 18, verse 6. Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Brethren, 
Those who practice dancing, modern dance, will miss heaven. When Paul mentions all those works of the flesh in Ephesians 5, he ends the, the passage in verse 21. As I have, he said, as I have also told you in the past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you want to miss out on heaven? Do you want to miss out on eternity? And continue to do those things. So get another sin, a little sin. The sin of sexual immorality. In the last 40 years, 50, this nation has done a 180 regarding sexual immorality. I teach history part-time, and I guarantee you it wasn't always that way. TV, movies, the Internet, social media has, has, is saturated with promiscuity. Sex outside the God-ordained God bonds of marriage is joked about, encouraged, and even expected. Oh, everybody does that. Young people especially are drawn into something that will destroy their lives. And it's all done in the name of love. And it's not love, it's lust. And you could go on about sexually transmitted diseases which are on the rise. You may not hear about this, but they're on the rise. They have been for a long time. How about the rise of illegitimate births? In some communities in our nation, it approaches 70%. And it's expected. A year or two back in one of my classes, I was talking about a president of the United States that was, uh, to put it mildly, less than moral in many of his affairs that he had. And I had a, a girl made this observation. She wasn't being hard enough. He says, well, Ms. Ruffin, all men do that. <laughs> and she believed that. All men do that. Well, I said, well, this one doesn't. <laughs> anyway, I didn't, I didn't uh, you know, say much, but still, the Bible has not changed in its opposition to sexual relations outside of marriage. Society may change, but the Bible hasn't changed. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, the Holy Spirit says, Marriage is honorable to in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Now, why is it a sin? It's a sin against one's own body, number one. It's against a sin against God's Word, number one. Number two, it's a sin against one's own body. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. Paul says, flee fornication. Fornication being sex outside of marriage. Flee fornication. Run from it. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. It is a violation of God's intent for sexuality. We've made it, made it, we've corrupted it. Genesis 2, verse 24. Moses says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Immorality can destroy the soul unless it's repented of. And I have known many, many, almost countless examples of this. Revelation 21, verse 8 again. Miss all those sins. Right there, smack dab in the middle, is the word whoremonger which you don't hear much anymore. Sexual immoral. And John adds, if you continue doing this, you shall have, the, have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. In other words, it's worse than death. Physical death. Brethren, what can be done to save our nation? One thing we can do is not to be part of any of this. The moral slide in our, in our nation. We can say no. We can refuse. 
Proverbs 1, verse 10, Solomon says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. We should not be part of any sin, brethren. We should be careful who we fellowship, who we associate with. There are many in this world that even have Christian beside them that we should have nothing to do with. They may be nice people. They may be good to their children and nice to their, their pets. But they're not what God says is a Christian. We need to say no. Ephesians 5.11 Paul says, Have no fellowship. Don't worship with them. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And that can imply, like I said, not just moral things, but religiously as well. We must realize that what we do in this life will have eternal consequences. We may think great thoughts. We may have warm feelings in our heart to the Lord. But what we do can matter. Galatians 6, verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man doeth, whatsoever man soweth, pardon me, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth the spirit Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And then think on this verse, brethren, as I often do. 1 Corinthians 5, or 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done, whether it be good or bad, someday. Some for us, maybe some for us sooner than later. We will stand before the judge. We'll be judged for what we have done, and I might add what we've not done too. But what we have done in the body. We can help save our nation and ourselves by turning to God at His Word for guidance. Proverbs 3, verse 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lead not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Brethren, if we have seen this morning, I hopefully, hopefully, what our society considers little can damn our soul. As Christians, we need to throw off the shackles of sin and serve one with the Lord. James 4, verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Maybe this morning you're not a Christian. You need this very hour. Repent of all your sins. Confess the name of Jesus, the Son of God. And be baptized for the mission of your sins. And then begin to walk in the newness of life. Maybe you haven't done that as a Christian. You've not lived that life. You've not fellowshiped with your brethren as you should. Maybe you need to repent this morning and continue to walk in the light. Because what is the opposite, brother? It's walking in darkness. No one of us want to do that. If this is your need this morning. Please come as we stand and sing. Okay. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Right.